Hello and welcome to another episode of the Monday Book Club. This week we're rounding off our look at Stig Larsson's Millennium Trilogy by taking a look at the final of the three books, The Girl Kicked the Hornet's Nest. Is it good? Is it bad? Will it finish the trilogy in style? Let's find out. The Girl Kicked the Hornet's Nest is the third book in Stig Larsson's Millennium Trilogy, which we all know by now was not intended to actually be a trilogy, but a series. Once again, we have an English title that completely loses the point of the original. In Swedish, the novel it translates as The Air Castle That Blew Up, a Swedish play on words that would translate into English as something like The Pipe Dream That Burst. And I think we can all agree that this gives a totally different vibe to the book than the official English title. The novel opens immediately following the events of the girl who played with fire and presents us with the first novel in which Lisbeth is essentially locked up for the whole story. She's first in hospital and then in custody before finally going to trial after a prolonged conspiracy against her. So what we have here is, in essence, a role reversal from the first book for Salando and Mikael Blomqvist, her journalist and sometimes partner. Whereas in Dragon Tattoo, Blomqvist was stuck in a tiny town and surrounded by potential enemies while Salander was free to roam around and help with his investigation, this time it's Salander who has to cope with being cooped up with enemies literally at the door, while Blomqvist works from the outside to assist her. Not that she doesn't still make as good use of her surroundings as possible, although the previous books demonstrated Salander's hacking abilities quite well, it's this novel that cements her reputation as one of fiction's greatest computer security experts. We get a brilliant demonstration of her abilities as she communicates with Blomqvist via editing a text file on his home computer using her PDA, and also monitors several of her enemies' computers using the same device a device that she's having to continually hide from both hospital staff and other visitors because she simply can't trust anyone around her. It's a compelling and very believable read. Larson is a master of presenting us with just enough information about how Salander is hacking things to let us follow the story, but not enough that her methods will become dated too quickly as technology moves forward. This masterly weaving of story isn't without its faults in places, however. The main enemy of this tale is the Section, a shady group of Swedish spies who are protecting their own backsides as much as they are the defector that they have been harbouring for decades. The Section is the powerful backer of the conspiracy against Salander that got her institutionalised when she was a child and they are still working against her now. However, they don't come across as the shady, powerful elites that they should be because they are portrayed as out of date and immensely bureaucratic. This may be intentional on Larson's part, as they do contrast the modern information-gathering methods of Blomqvist's Millennium magazine and Salander's hacker network very nicely, but even taking this into account, they come across as far too ineffectual to be able to achieve what they actually manage to achieve. Despite that, this is a compelling novel. It weighs in at a far higher page count than the previous two books, but it's a far quicker and far more involving read than The Girl Who Played With Fire, at times matching the staying power of the original novel. Once again, we have a string of interweaving plot threads that mesh together expertly, and once again, we have a tightly focused main storyline with a definite time limit that mirrors the original novels. In Dragon Tattoo, Blomqvist needed to solve the mystery before the murderer got wind of what he was doing, while here, Salander and Blomqvist need to unravel the conspiracy and put together all the evidence they'll need to protect Salander before her trial. It's the time limit factor that's so important, because it keeps the tension rising. Speaking of the trial, this has to be one of the best sequences in the whole trilogy. Speaking as someone who studied law and has a fair amount of experience with the English legal system, I found this look at how the Swedish legal system works to be fascinating. While I appreciate that not everyone will have the same response to this sequence as I did, because not everyone is a legal nerd like I am, there's a lot here that plays out really well. It's a courtroom drama, with all the twists and turns that are typical of that genre, but there are some hilarious portions to the trial as well. I literally laughed out loud at several points, because Larson is using this part of the story to hammer home just how much of an out-of-touch joke the legal system can become when it's misused by people who are intent on protecting their own power at any cost. There's just one thing I had trouble swallowing with this finale, however. Who in their right mind brings child porn with them to their court appearance? I'm sorry, but that bit just felt like it was needing to wrap up the plot without having to put in another chapter. It's ludicrous, and it took me right out of the story, which is a shame because the rest is so great. I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in thinking that was stupid either. But despite that one quibble, The Girl Who Kicked the Hornet's Nest is a fantastic book, and I think if you give it a try, you'll be impressed. 
Stig Larsson has put together a fantastic end to his trilogy, and even though it was supposed to be part 3 in a series of about 10 novels, and there are some plot threads that are still left open as a result, it's nevertheless a fitting end to the story. If there'd never been any further books, and we'd just been left with these original three, there's enough of a fitting ending here that it would have been okay. So there you are. It's actually a pretty good book, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think I read it in just about two days, which is good considering the size of the book. But it is enjoyable, I recommend it, and if you haven't read the Millennium Trilogy yet, do give it a try, because they're all very good books. But anyway, that's all we've got time for this week, so thank you very much for watching. I hope you did like this, and if you did, remember to click the like button. Share it with your friends so that they know a good book too when they see it. And do subscribe for future videos, because there will be more in the future. But until the next time, I've been Zoe Kirk Robinson, you've been watching the Monday Book Club on ZJKR, and I'll see you next week.